You know, I have to say it's a little bit weird and odd to be known as one of the women that Bill Clinton rescued from North Korea. <laughs> or the North Korea girl, as I'm sometimes referred to as. Um, but if what happens finally allows me to tell the story that we set out to tell, I will gladly wear those designations. In March of last year, my colleague and I were on assignment for Current TV, and we had traveled to northeastern China to report on North Korean defectors, people who are fleeing the very desperate conditions in their homeland, where starvation is widespread, where even the most basic of rights are non-existent, and they are fleeing across the border to China. On the morning of March 17th, my team and I were filming along the Tumen River. It was frozen at the time, and this is the thoroughfare that separates China from North Korea. Um, we were there to document this area where defectors are crossing into China. And um, it was never our intention to, to enter North Korea. Um, that morning, we were there with a local guide and foreign journalists, when we travel overseas, we often hire local fixers, we call them. People who are familiar with the area, who have worked with um, the media, and, um, and, and, and we trusted our fixer to take us to this location. While on the ice, he continued to walk across and motioned for us to follow, and we followed him. And we were a couple steps on the other side taking some video when we turned back across uh, to, to head back to China. And we were about halfway across the ice when we heard soldiers yelling. I turned around and saw two North Korean soldiers with their rifles raised in the air running towards us. And I ran for my life. Um, they were able to apprehend my colleague and I when we were on Chinese soil and violently drag us into North Korea where we were taken captive. And, you know, at one moment I'm doing my job, I'm a journalist reporting on this humanitarian crisis that neither country, neither China nor North Korea wants the world to know about. And in the very next instant, I am held prisoner in the most isolated country in the world. I'd felt like I had entered this alien planet. I didn't know if I would ever see my family again. I didn't know if I would survive until the next day. Um, my colleague and I were placed in a, in a jail along the border and eventually transferred to the capital city, Pyongyang. That's where we were separated. And I proceeded to go through interrogations, hours and hours, day after day. And one day, my interrogator came into the room and he asked me a question that I had been fearing. He said, he asked, has your sister ever been to North Korea? So I've been working as a journalist for about 20 years. Um, almost half of my life. And I've had the fortunate opportunity to travel all over the world several times over for my work. But there was always one country in the world that I was most curious about, the one that is considered to be the most secretive and isolated country in the world, North Korea. But I never in my wildest dreams ever thought I would get the opportunity to actually see North Korea myself. Um, and one day, a renowned cataract surgeon friend of mine from Nepal called me out of the blue to tell me that the North Korean government had invited him in to conduct medical missions throughout the country. He, the, the trip would, be, uh, would consist of three different cities, and they would invite people from around the country to come and, and be seen by this this renowned international doctor. So knowing that North Korea was the one place I'd always wanted to visit, he asked me if I would like to accompany him and be part of the medical team. The caveat, however, was that I wouldn't, I, I was not able to say that I was a journalist. I had to say that I was part of this medical delegation. And it's kind of ironic because even though I'm Asian, I'm terrible at math and science and anything medical. So <laughs> the fact that that's the way I got into North Korea is kind of funny. Um, but nevertheless, that is how I became part of the team. And so we entered North Korea. I was the only American in the country, I was told, with this Nepalese team. And from the second we arrived in Pyongyang, it was obvious that the soil was different. I was, I was, I felt like I was on another planet. We had to give over our cell phones because we were told that no one in the country is allowed a cell phone. And, and the dogma there, is that people are told that 
because the United States, because uh, North Korea is still technically at war, still with the United States, American satellites might be able to detect cell phone activity, and therefore that's why North Koreans can't have cell phones. The reality is that they probably can't afford cell towers in North Korea, and they're also trying to severely repress any kind of information from, from getting out. And, and other than landlines, they know that, they, that cell phones would provide them that opportunity to do so. So I didn't think that going in with this medical delegation would allow me to, to really get a sense of what North Korea was really like. I figured we'd be in the operating rooms most of the time, and I would just be kind of watching these operations take place. But I actually found that it was such a unique window into this culture because most of us know that if we come down or if someone comes down with a, a, a cataract or, or someone develops a cataract, it's a very easy, inexpensive procedure. We rarely even hear about it these days in the States. But in the third world, it is so debilitating that people can live for decades in total blindness because of cataracts. So what, what happened was it was broadcast via the two television stations in North Korea to the public that this cataract surgeon from Nepal was coming to perform these missions. And it was astounding that thousands of people showed up at these different camps, but not just with vision problems. People showed up with, with heart conditions or, or chronic, chronic ailments with, with, with uh, to, uh, oral issues that they had been plagued with for, for long periods of time. And obviously, the doctor and his team were there for cataracts, and he still ended up conducting over a thousand cataract operations over the course of 13 days in three different cities, including on children who were as young as eight years old. And so for this process, I told my minders, and there were six to eight minders who were tasked with watching over us at all times, that would really help for us to be able to see someone in their own home so that we could see how he or she might navigate before the surgery and after the surgery. We never thought that we would actually be allowed to go into a home, but somehow, for some reason, they agreed. And so they allowed us to visit this typical North Korean family's home. There were about eight people who lived in this one bedroom apartment. Um, they all slept on the floor, which is very common. Um, it's not because of poverty that they sleep on the floor. It's a, it, it, it is a sort of traditional way of sleeping. But the house did not have a single photograph of any family members. There were only photographs, and they were large and beautiful, of the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, and the great leader, Kim Il-sung. That's it. And the mere mention of the dear leader or his father would be enough to inspire this unbelievable emotion. People will start crying in unison at the mere mention of the dear leader's name.